Thank you. Uh, very honored to be the first speaker and kick this off. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and we could talk all day, I could talk all day, uh, having been building businesses for the better part of 25 years. Um, for today, uh, there's just six topics that I've chosen. Uh, I think these are the, the most essential topics for us as we're thinking about starting our first business. Uh, this is really directed at people who have never started a business before. Uh, if you have started one uh, in the room, congratulations, you know how hard it is. Uh, and the primary audience is, is folks who've never been through it before. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so this is my, my fifth business. Uh, first one started on the backs of my mortgage, sold it to a public company called Gartner. Uh, the next several have been venture backed. Uh, the second one is now worth one and a half billion dollars. Went through a bunch of ups and downs. I exited at a down and I didn't protect my stock. And so uh, I didn't participate in that one and a half billion dollars, sadly. Uh, the third business uh, where I met the CEO of Fermion, who I'm helping uh, was a company we built to 35 people and sold to a public company called Google. Uh, fourth company, a robotics company, and now today I'm the, the chief operating officer at Fermion. Uh, as, as was said, we're bringing the third wave of cloud computing, leveraging WebAssembly. Uh, we, we've got a serverless offering with stunning performance, and that's the extent of my advertisement. So as we get into these six topics, uh, this first topic is product market fit. And if you take one thing and one, only one thing away from this conversation, it is that product market fit is pretty much the only thing you need to care about for the first phase of your startup. Uh, you're going to want to spend 66 to 80% of your time just focused on product market fit. And the phrase that I love that captures sort of the essence of what product market fit is, is that your offering flies off the shelf. And what do you need for an offering to fly off the shelf? You need three things. One, you have to have a problem in your customer's mind that is a significant enough problem for you, for them to want to solve. Two, your solution has to be the best fit solution. And three, the price has to be accessible for the problem that you're solving. If those three things are true, then you've got product market fit and your product will fly off the shelf. So that's sort of the dominant thing you wanna think about product market fit. And what's interesting with an open source business is that you have to do this twice. As if building a startup isn't hard enough. When you do it normally and you're, you know, your first product people are paying you money for, there's an exchange of value, okay, great. But with an open source offering, you have to do this twice. Your, pro your open source has to fly off the shelf, and then you have to figure out how to get money uh, in your second iteration for it to fly off the shelf. The second topic is capital. Uh, I believe that the best startups are driven by customer capital. And this is how you want to think. You, you want your mindset to be almost exclusively on how do I get customer capital? And if you think about this, uh, th this is how business is supposed to work. It's, it's worked this way for centuries. People who have an offering go to a customer and they say, my offering has value. You're going to pay me money and I'm going to make a little bit of money on this. And, I'm, and each time I'm going to put that money into the next thing I make and into the next customer. And if you think about Steve Jobs and, and that story, uh, you know, they were in a garage. There's a reason they were in a garage. He didn't have any money. And there's a reason why the first product they built was only 100 units. The Apple One was 100 units. It sold out really quickly, so they made some money, and they took that money and they put it into several more 100 units, and then they built the Apple II and sold those. So there was no, there was no outside capital. So that's, you know, that's sort of lesson number two. And uh, and you want to keep in mind in that phase, you are not going to be spending a lot of money. You're not going to be making a lot of money. Uh, and if it takes a while for you to build your product, okay, it's going to take a while. So you're not taking a salary. You're dipping into your mortgage if you've got one. You're dipping into your savings. You're eating rice and beans. You're living on, on a shoestring. And most people don't want to do that. And that's why most people aren't entrepreneurs. 
Okay, so let's say you do want to take other people's money. Um, the thing to realize about taking out other people's money is it is brutally difficult. It is really, if you're not willing to, to part with your own money, if you're not willing to part with your savings, if you're not willing to part with your mortgage, it's really hard to get somebody else to convince, convinced to part ways with, with their money. And really, you know, as the slide says, I think venture capital is a necessary evil. It's not a great influence. When you think about building a business, it's hard enough and there's a cadence to it. But venture capital changes that cadence. Venture capital basically says, you have to perform faster because I need to get my money out. And, and it's really a more modern uh, construct. Right? It's 50 years old-ish. Uh, I don't necessarily think venture capital is, is a great influence on startups because it, it sort of changes the discipline you need to stay focused on delivering a, a solution that is so valuable to your customers that the product's going to fly off the shelf. If you do think that you want to or need to convince somebody else to give you some money, just recognize that credibility is a really difficult thing to, ha to have and to get, and you will be competing with hundreds of thousands of no-name people that have no credibility. So you're always selling. You're always, always, always selling. You are selling when you're convincing employees to join you, vendors to support you, customers to buy your product, and venture capital. Even when you're not, quote unquote, raising money, if you're talking to a venture capitalist, you're selling, and all of the other activity you're doing with customers, vendors, et cetera, they're gonna be checking, the venture capitalists are gonna be checking. And the best and easiest way for you to get credibility is to have customers. So we sort of get back to customer capital, um, because venture money is going to look for that, that credibility coming from customers. And the last, uh, next thing to understand about venture is they are driven almost exclusively by emotion. And those two emotions are fear and greed. Yeah, there's logic. There's always logic. They have to tick a bunch of boxes about your startup. And they do that. But ultimately, it's going to come down to fear and greed. And they are paid to be fearful. They are paid to screen out every single problem with every single business. They screen hundreds and hundreds of businesses each year and they choose one. And they only choose one because they got greedy, right? Because there was something in that conversation, something in your credibility, there's something about the market that says, oh my goodness, this could be a home run for me. Uh, so just remember fear and greed. Uh, a note on dilution. I have this conversation with lots and lots of people. Dilution is the silliest thing to pay any attention to. It only matters in the mediocre outcome state. In the failure state, nobody makes any money. Dilution is irrelevant. In the success case, your business is worth gazillions of dollars, and you're going to walk away with so many millions of dollars that you've never had before. And do you really care whether you put $25 million or $22 million in the bank? No, you don't. So don't worry about dilution. Don't try to optimize for how much of your business you're giving away. Uh, just remember that cash is the most important thing for your business and get the cash. And then lastly, your job as founders, if you're gonna get venture money, is to create this greed and it's to create competition amongst capital partners. When banks compete, you win. You win because you get to set the terms, you get to negotiate, and most importantly, you get to decide Who's the wise advisor that sits at the board table with me and counsels me on the business? That's what you want to look for when you're choosing a venture partner, if you're fortunate enough to be able to choose, is choose somebody who's going to be a really wise counsel, counselor for you. The next topic is co-founding. Uh, most people can't start a business by themselves because it's brutally hard. Uh, it, it's the same reason that a lot of people can't get their workout routine going. They need a gym buddy, a gym friend. Uh, it's a lot easier to go to the gym and experience all that pain when you've got a friend uh, who's experiencing that pain with you and helps you get out of bed uh, and go experience that pain. It's the same thing with, with startups. Much, much easier to experience a bunch of pain with uh, somebody that you're working with. And when you choose a partner, it is a partnership. You're gonna be spending most of your life with this individual for years. And what you want to remember is this is a important partnership and the singular thing you want to look for in that partnership is shared values. 
I, I have so many stories of partnerships and companies that just absolutely blew up because the founders did not share values. One founder wanted to spend money because you had to go big or go home, and the other was like, no, 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 we need to be cautious and conservative with the way we spend money. Destroyed. They just ate each other apart over time. Those sorts of core values have to be agreed on. And, and my recommendation, I've written a blog post about this, is that you actually sit down and you go through your core values in rank order and their core values in rank order and you see that you have overlap. And if your top three or four values, they aren't anywhere in their top five, get out of there. It's not gonna be a marriage that lasts. Uh, so just remember, right, divorces destroy. Our fifth topic, build a great team. Your only potential competitive advantage is the speed at which you can operate with a pittance of resources. You need, to you need to take those resources, which are minuscule, and you need to outperform everybody else who has way more resource than you do. And the only way you can do that is with a core group of people who are rowing in synchronicity, in the same direction, with effort and energy. That's a high-performing team. You have, to, you have to do this. And so my singular ask on this slide is go read the five dysfunctions of a team. Patrick Lencioni, magnificent book, it outlines exactly all the characteristics you need. Google did empirical research on their high-performing teams called Project Aristotle. Go read that. Uh, that is great material. And guarantee you that if you've got 10 or 20 people who are rowing in synchronicity with speed, with alacrity, you're going to run circles around teams of 100 or 200. And so your 2 million in capital is going to compete with 20 million. That product manager at a large company going in and asking for 20 million, most of the time doesn't happen. <clears throat> so that's your competitive advantage. And then finally, people ask me, what are the two most essential traits if I want to start a business? <clears throat> and my answer is, you have to have two. One is you have to have a maniacal belief that you have value to deliver to the world, and your belief is so maniacal it borders on, on insane. It's, it's that crazy. It's that level of belief. And two, you have to have intimate comfort with the concept of fear and failure. You are going to fail over and over and over again, and those are going to be course corrections that make you stronger, and you're going to adapt, and you're going to succeed. And you're going to face risk and fear all the time, whether it's putting your mortgage and your savings on the line, whether it's putting employees on the line, whatever. You're going to experience that. And so if you're not, again, familiar and comfortable with that, it's not going to work. And again, that's why, you know, 99.5% of the great ideas out there never happen, is because the people don't have the, the, the internal makeup. They don't have that, that level of passion, and they don't have that level of comfort with fear. So I want to leave you in that context with just a quote from, uh, from Steve Jobs. I had the good fortune to work at Apple for almost 10 years at the beginning of my career. Um, so I revere Steve a lot. And he was asked, what's the characteristic that a, a good entrepreneur needs? And he said, people say you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. And it's totally true. The reason is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person, any rational person would give up. And there it is. He, right? He's talking about that belief that borders on, on insane, irrational. So those are my six topics. I purposefully did that uh, in a relatively short amount of time so that we'd have plenty of time for questions, um, which I'll take at this time. Sorry, uh, yep, on the aisle up here. Um, yes, you, the, oh yeah, okay. I have a question. You were talking about the core values lining up with your partner. Yeah. However, I've seen situations where it's good to have diversity on them, where having one complements the other instead of both being crazy and coming down the pipe together being an issue. Yeah, but that's a fantastic point. Values are different from diversity. Um, values are different than beliefs. And so, yes, you want to have a variety of beliefs. You want to have a, a variety of lived experiences. Absolutely, you want that diversity. But your core values are core. 
beliefs get changed with evidence, and they get changed with situations. And, uh, and it, lived experience is, is just what you have with you. And, and just, I mean, you're just going to have to trust me from having seen so many partnerships destroyed by, by a lack of shared values. Values are more fundamental. Uh, and, and when they conflict, they, they conflict inside you in such an emotional way that it's really hard to get, to get over that because it's about your identity and your partner's identity. Um, so, but great question. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Um, is it better to like have a team of three co-founders than two co-founders so uh like taking decisions um like uh is led to uh is led by a vote we can say uh i think it's i don't think there's a a good or bad i don't think there's a a significant differential i, I think when you've got three co-founders who are so committed and have that sort of uh, irrational level of belief about what you're doing. That's just a, more effort and more more energy towards the mission. Uh, and again, when you share the mission and when you share values, usually decisions, you know, happen in a relatively straightforward way. Yeah. I mean, I personally do believe that that groups of people don't make decisions unless it's you know some sort of governance, like a in the U.S. Supreme Court. In a business, individuals make decisions, and so even if you have three co-founders. Which decisions are you making? Which ones are the second one making? Which one's the third one making? And it, it's, it's, you know, there's only a few decisions that are so foundational that the three of you need to uh, get together and, and sort of debate it and come to, to a consensus. Okay, so, uh, so uh, a sense of tolerance should be, uh, like, is necessary between partners? Uh, because sure, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and it's not to say that solo founders don't succeed. They do, right? Uh, solo founders are, are often, uh, you know, quite certain about themselves and, and their mission. Uh, and, you know, and they sort of operate more as, uh, as a, uh, you know, as a monarchy. You've seen success. It's just those are, those are the few and far between uh, versus, versus teams of people who share values and, and, and a mission. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what do you think of uh, startup accelerators like uh, Y Combinator then? Yeah, I think these are, are pretty essential in the ecosystem for founders that don't have credibility because that's, what, that's essentially what those accelerators are doing is they're giving you the first, the first hint of credibility, right? By getting accepted, you're getting through a screen, a credibility screen, and capital is gonna look at that and say, oh great, you know, of, the, of all the options I have, here's the 10%, here's the 15% that got through that screen, and therefore they've got more credibility. Firstly, and secondly, um, the programs themselves. You know, I've been a mentor in Techstars since the very beginning and, and have mentored you know, dozen of a dozen companies. The programs themselves do a great job of teaching. Right? I mean, that's a 25-minute session. Right? Those are 90-day those are immersive programs, immersive sessions, which... By the way, the first third of it is all about product market fit. Um, so I think they're quite good. Uh, and, and usually it's worth, again, back to the dilution comment at the beginning, usually it's worth the 6% that they take from, from you. Uh, and, and it's worth the, you know, however much capital, it used to be with 100,000 with Techstars, maybe it's still that way, that you get. Uh, and, and you get a cohort of co-founders, right? So uh, of, of peers, right? And, that's another thing, right? Having peers, having people who are going through the same experience as you are at the same time, you know, you don't need them as a gym buddy, but in the gym, you know, seeing a lot of people who are experiencing a lot of pain, that's just, you know, that just helps get you out of bed and gives you a little bit more motivation. It gives you a little bit more of a support structure. Tim, I'll ask the next question here. When should people avoid venture capital, right? When is it, you know, you have a great idea and you go to pitch it and they tell you like, hey, this isn't something that scales or is always it for, for venture. Oh, so my, my first answer is always, it's always good to avoid venture capital. You, you want to start from first principles, which is I need to get customer capital. And e even, if that's, even if that's going to customers who are going to find so much value and saying, hey, 
I'm going to choose you as one of my first three customers. You're going to give me enough money to build this product because you're going to help direct it. Um, there, there are other, other moments, and, and I think you referred to this, where, um, where it is so hard to, to get money. It, it's a hardware company. It's a deep science company. Um, and, and I think the success pattern I've seen there is by getting government money, uh, you know, essentially grants that get you, that get you started, or again, some significant customer that gets you started. Of, oftentimes that is the government, right? The government may see something that's deep science, deep tech enough, uh, and, and, and that's your contribution is the sort of the depth of that science that you, that you understand where you're, gonna, where you're gonna be able to get that kind of capital. Uh, hello, very interesting uh, talk and thank you for sharing. Uh, you were talking about non-dilutive uh, financing and uh, saying that it's not that important to think about the percentage of dilution that you left during the negotiation. Uh, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. How do you manage uh, the loss of control that can occur with this dilution? Because I saw many situations where co-founders yeah. were just fired out because of that. Yeah, so, that's right. Venture is a necessary evil. Don't take it if you don't have to. <laughs> Because that's the deal. You're making a deal with the devil. You're making a deal that I have to turn your money into more money quickly. And, you're, and they are now your owners. They're not necessarily your majority owners in terms of the amount of, com of the company they own, but they're definitely your owners in, in terms of what they can control. Right? They can control whether you are the CEO or not. Uh, and, and by the way, they should, right? <laughs> I mean. These are po folks who, if you get the right partner, they've got vast amounts of experience with what the success patterns are. And if your behavior as the CEO is dysfunctional, right? If your behavior as a CEO is, is you know, pushing things in a direction that the mission isn't gonna be achieved and their money isn't gonna turn into more, then you should go, right? That's just called accountability. So, but yes, <laughs> right? This is, this is why you wanna think really, really carefully before you take other people's money because you're you're because that's the deal is that you're putting them into positions of holding you accountable and having those those positions on your cap table my comment about dilution is don't worry about 20% dilution versus 18 versus 17 versus 23% it's just silly right because when you do the math over two or three rounds it, it ends up being like again like a net total of 10% of at, at the end and and then Again, when you do the math in the success case, you're walking away with many millions of dollars and boo-hoo, you didn't have a half a million dollars or whatever. Regarding uh, found raising, uh, you, you say that we have, um, we have to seek for customer um, capital mm -hmm. or venture capital. What are your thoughts on love money, which is taking money from your family and relatives dangerous um, most I mean most people start there right because because those who love you find you credible <laughs> it's true um, and uh, and so you know here you are you have an irrational belief that your thing is is so valuable to society that society needs it you know it's it's hard for a loved one to sort of not get drawn into that passion uh, and it and it comes with dangers, right? Um, I think my counsel there is is to be really, really clear with your loved ones. You could lose this money. No, 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 really, for real. You could lose this money, and if you can't afford to lose this money, do not give it to me, right? Just if if you would go to Las Vegas and put this money down on black, knowing that there's a fifty chance, fifty percent chance you'd lose it. Great, I'll take your money. If you would never do that, don't give it to me because there's less than a 50-50% chance that I'm going to turn your money into money. So just, right, just have a really clear, good conversation with them. Hello. Uh, it's here. Oh, great, thanks. thanks for the talk. Uh, you were talking about uh, passion <coughs> um, uh, while, doing the, while growing the business. Uh, do you think that there is a thing uh, such as too much passion? And if there is, uh, how, how would you detect it, in your opinion, of course? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I suppose in theory there's such a thing as too much passion. Uh, 
I, I think it's hard to figure out when that might be. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a concept of attachment, right? If, if, you, if you embed too much of who you are as an individual in your passion, that's dangerous, right? Because then the failures are going to eat at you 10 times as much, and you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I'm such a terrible person because it's my identity. Um, so, yeah, I, I, think you wanna, uh, I think you want to be really clear that your passion is directed at this passion, at this concept in this moment of time. It's not, it's not me. It's not my identity uh, that's at stake here. Tim, we're going to take probably two more questions, yeah. maybe three. I see three hands. Again, right? It's a topic we could talk about all day. So I'm going to ask yep. a question. Given that we're in an open source conference, one mistake I, I kind of see a lot where a founder is really excited about the technology and not so excited about the business part, getting customers, <laughs> pricing things, going through that whole motion. What is your advice when a team of founders has a, you know, a love for the technology, not so much the business? Start a nonprofit. Seriously, just, just put, the, put the technology into a nonprofit and be really clear with whoever is going to you know, give you donations to feed your process. It's a nonprofit. If, if, you, if you don't have passion for building a for-profit thing, don't do it. One good example would be like Let's Encrypt. I think they had a really great product, open source project, and they went the nonprofit route. Lots of people use Let's Encrypt. If you, I don't know, but they are a nonprofit. They are not a venture-backed uh, company selling a for-profit for business. Would that be a good example of going that route? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question. Is there any sense in exploring venture to benefit from those success patterns they may be familiar with? Yeah, there's some benefit to it. Uh, and if you... Again, if you believe that you've got the credibility, and, and, and again, usually, usually you're building credibility because you've, you've built the beginnings of a thing and customers are coming towards you and, and, and sort of validating the beginnings of product market fit. And so, yeah, venture capital can certainly accelerate that. And, and I think that's a great place to look at and think about taking venture capital is, is if you're sort of bursting at the seams with, oh my gosh, I have product market fit. There are customers, and I can't serve customers fast enough. That's a beautiful moment. Um, and, and yeah, they do bring a lot of wisdom and a lot of pattern matching. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of ways to get that wisdom and pattern matching without them necessarily being a part of your cap table and owning a, a piece of your business. Uh, again, un unless right, there's the situation where you've got um, sort of pretty clear pathways and runway um, to growth. I think maybe one more. Um, so my question here will be, when you start this business with your partners and you know, you know, you, you're expecting to be successful mm -hmm. and, and that's the expectation for everyone. But then when you're just, you're just like starting to be successful and you didn't agree from, from the first stand, like how we're going to divide this, like what's, it, what's it like the right moment to agree on what if we, you know, if we hit the pocket, like, hit the jetpack, like, how, how are we going to divide this stuff? At the beginning. Yeah, I'm, those, all of those sorts of questions are at the beginning conversation in this scenario, in that scenario. Uh, and, and walk yourself back and say, are we all comfortable with the way we're going to behave in, in this scenario? Can I? Yeah, please. Okay. And, but... Commonly, in, maybe in the beginning, you know, certainly on like who's going to invest most of their time or be more valuable to the company, and then may, you might make mistake on those decisions. Uh, yeah, this is this is true. You know, so how you split your cap table at the beginning, it, it is it's a negotiation amongst the partners. So um, the thing I usually counsel is make sure that you have a five-year stock vesting period and a two-year vest. So. No businesses, most businesses aren't going to have any hint of getting off the ground for at least two years. And so it gives you two years as a partnership to figure out who's adding value. Are they adding enough value? Are they adding the kind of value that they, that they have on the cap table? Uh, and, right, and, and after two years, great, two years of your stock has vested, and then you still got three more to go, right? Um, 
And, and that, that gives your partnership time, and it also, you know, even three years into this, if one of you isn't p- pulling the weight, then the other two partners are like, well, at least we got back two years of their, of their capital, right? They didn't, they didn't just walk off because it was granted at the very beginning. So thanks, that's, that's a, a piece that I usually counsel pretty strongly. Um, is it risky if um, like um, two co-founders doesn't share the same, uh, I don't know, risk awareness or level or uh, 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 like a rationality level? Or is it good to have some kind of balance uh, while taking like yeah, it's good. To, it's good to have some risk balance. It's good to have a dreamer and a skeptic and meet in the middle. Okay. Uh, you know, again, those usually aren't sort of core values. Um, it's just sort of how do I operate in the world? Yeah, but the, um, so. like the, the difference in this kind of, like kind of core value, is it good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think so. All right, Tim, I'm going to give you your last question here. Oh. There are a lot more startup employees than there are founders. And so there are a lot of people here that are probably maybe not being necessarily interested in becoming a founder, but they might want to go work for a startup. You know, one question that I've learned is many, um, how much runway do you have? And looking for that honest answer and why, what would be your advice for someone that's looking to join a startup? How should they evaluate that startup? How should they think about compensation, including equity? Uh, what would your advice be to them given that 25 years of experience? That's a, it's a complicated question. Um, Take all the time yeah. you need. <laughs> runway, um, you know, runway for me, six to 12 months, you're not, you don't really have any better answer from any big company you're going to join. You know, might there be layoffs six months after you join? Of course. And might you be impacted? Of course. Right? There's no, there's no, you know, there's, a, there's an impression that they're more solid. And, and they're, they are, you know, marginally. Um, but, you know, but I would look for six to 12 months, especially in, in today's world where most people can go get you know, another job relatively quickly in, in the tech industry. Um, you know, and then in terms of evaluation, you know, it's actually no different evaluation than an investor is doing. Is, is the market sizable enough and growing fast enough? Is your product uniquely differentiated and likely to compete, right, or likely to get product market fit? Is the team highly passionate about it? Uh, are you passionate about this mission? Uh, and, and do they have the sort of wherewithal to execute Right? Do they have the experience in this particular problem solution set space? So, I mean, those are the basics of what, uh, of what venture capital looks for when they invest. Because you're, in, you're doing the same thing. You're investing, you're investing your sort of marginal earning power today in return for tomorrow. And then in terms of equity, um, the, the industry is, is for the most part pretty bounded by how much equity they can give out. Uh, you know, uh, an executive is, is probably going to get no more than 1% of the equity. Uh, a senior engineer is probably going to get no more than sort of half a percent. And most people are going to get 0.1% to 2.2% as a, as a basis. A quick follow-up there. On the other side of this equation, hiring, how fast, how are you looking for talent? Most founders I know are hiring directly from their network. I used to work with this person at company A. I want to bring them on with this thing. But then eventually, you start hiring people you don't necessarily know. Uh, what's your advice on the other side of that equation? Once you get to that point, um, I go back to values. I mean, at, at the last three businesses, we've got our values agreement. It's, it's three or four pages uh, of the core values for the, for the business. And once we've determined that the person we've never met, they're not part of our network, has the competencies we're looking for, we're determining whether they have the values that we're looking for. Uh, and we actually have them sign an agreement. I understand these values. I'm going to model these. I'm going to uphold them. I'm going to hold other people accountable to them. Uh, and, and I'm going to sign those value statements. So thank you. Uh, great session. Uh, appreciate all the awesome questions. I, I, I'm glad that we spent uh, a lot of time with questions because uh, that's really the fun part of, of a talk like this. All right. Thank you, Tim. You.